Hi, I'm Peter Shergold. I'm the head of the Centre for Social Impact and welcome to the latest Yakety Yak with Peter Thompson. Tonight's guest is going to be hosted by Cisco, one of our corporate supporters, and the guest is Therese Rain, who was, for one period, First Lady of Australia, but more importantly, a really successful Australian businesswoman who's made her mark overseas and always understood the importance of community and society value to what she did. Please welcome Therese Rain. So Dad had... Um Dad was in a, um, a plane crash. Um, he was a, a RAF navigator during the Second World War. He was based, based in India. He was in a plane crash that resulted in a severe spinal injury that in time meant he was um, completely dependent on using a wheelchair. Um, so in time it meant that he was a paraplegic. Um, and But in the 1950s, after he and mum got married, they um, and after he had gone to university and after he had worked for a while as an aeronautical engineer, um, he wanted to do his master's in aeronautical engineering. Uh, and so he went, he resigned from his job and they packed up and they went for three years uh, to England. Um, and he went to London to do, to work um, at, uh, I think he worked at Farnborough um, Air Base um, as an aeronautical engineer and he studied and did his masters but he was also going to Stoke Mandeville Hospital because he was, at that point they were still looking for a cure. The Stoke Mandeville Hospital had a really strong sport as rehabilitation program um, and so they had all of their patients um, involved in sports, in wheelchair sports and so he became involved and he learnt to be an archer um, and he, um, he uh, in that context he carried um, the Australian flag in the precursor of the Paralympic Games um, and he um, continued to participate as a Paralympian for a number of years. What you're, what you're touching on are a series of <coughs> remarkable achievements by your father to yeah. overcome the disadvantage mm. of this spinal injury. Mm. For example, as I understand it, he was told, well, don't worry with university, there'll be a pension. Uh, yeah. And he faced many practical problems going to university. In yeah, those that's right. He was told, um, look, John, they won't let you into university because you're in a wheelchair. Um, they, you can't get to university because how are you going to do that? You won't be able to get into the lecture theatres because there are stairs. Um, of course, today he could study via some fine, kind of fabulous wireless network and participate. Yeah? Um, he, you know, and um, besides, you'll be dead by the time you're 25. So why would you do that? Um, and um, and then when he what he completed his degree, um, and he got a standing ovation at the Sydney Town Hall. Um, when he was awarded his degree, because people didn't think people in wheelchairs could do that. In, there was a kind of assumption that still plagues people with disabilities today, which is, so if you're in a wheelchair, you probably have a brain injury, mm. or if you're blind, you probably can't do X, Y, and Z, or if you can't hear, you probably can't do these things. So all these assumptions become limiters, um, uh, limiting assumptions around dedication of resources um, and belief in what people can or can't do. So um, he then wanted to work um, as an aeronautical engineer because work fundamentally matters to people. Um, he wanted to be independent, he wanted to earn his own money, he wanted to be challenged and learning, he wanted to be connected to a community, he wanted to play with planes and rockets. <laughs> which is what he loved um, and he was told look mate you're really you're owed a pension you're owed a pension um, the country owes you you've done your bit you can get a total and permanent incapacity pension so and besides mate you've got a disability just in case you hadn't noticed um, and, um, and so they're not going to give you a job so he you know there was a long journey to win employment well I can see straight away a through line between your yeah. father's life and what shaped your life yeah um, your mother elizabeth mm. who still lives in she lives in brisbane, brisbane now yeah, yeah. Um, 
she met your father at Concord Repat Hospital. Yeah, so she was a physio in the days when if you were a woman and working in the public sector and you got married, you had to resign. Um, and um, so she, um, but so she had um, been in the WAF and she was part of the whole, um, the whole um, service persons, repatriated service persons um, participation in either employ in um, education or employment or in farming or whatever, um, with very enabling program which is what Dad accessed as well. Um, and so she went to university in Queensland and studied to be a physiotherapist. Um, she comes from a, a long line of very strong women. Um, and, um, and so she just thought she could. Um, and so she became a physiotherapist. She went to Concord Hospital and she um, met Dad at Concord. So she's involved in rehab, as it turns out. You would yeah. be too. Yeah. Uh, she clearly had a view about financial independence. Yeah, she did. She said, what's yours is ours and what's mine is mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. uh, <laughs> that, no, is that presumably, right? presumably that came from living with your father and the reality of... of the reality, yeah, exactly. The, re the reality of the fact that he may not have a long life. Exactly. So the doctors kept saying to Dad, well, you'll be dead by the time you're 25, you'll be dead by the time you're 30 you'll be dead by the time you're 35 and on it went. Um, and so they would take a year at a time. So they would break it down. They'd go, okay, this year, this is what we want to do. Um, and they live here and now. And they, neither of them take very kindly to people saying, no, you can't. <clears throat> so they actually challenged a lot of barriers. They challenged barriers about um, getting married, they challenge barriers about having children, they challenge barriers about taking out a loan, they challenge barriers about going on a ship to England. Going on a ship. To England. Um, they challenged, well, there are all these bulkheads everywhere. Oh, of course. <laughs> um, yeah. And at the, that point, I think Dad's wheelchair didn't have brakes, so it was quite awkward <laughs> on the roll <laughs> to roll back, <laughs> take the Would have been one way of getting rid of it. and cut the duck. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so um, they challenged barriers all the time, and they challenged perceptions about who they were um, and what their mu relationship must be like. So she's a very strong person. Whether they uh, wanted to do this or whether they would have done it in other circumstances, they both became advocates, really, didn't they? I think they became examples. I think they became living examples of what's possible. And um, But they did do advocacy, didn't they? Um, I suppose they did argument. <laughs> <laughs> they did policy argument a lot. Like, why does it have to be like this? Um, but they did it... Um, they did it on a, um, here's an example, we want to adopt a child, um, being told, well, you're not a suitable parent, even though I had already been born. Mm -hmm. So you're not, you know, you're not a suitable parent because you're going to die by the time you're 35, you know, um, and a man in a wheelchair can't be a suitable parent. Well, I'd like to know, I'd like to know who has a better family life like who has um, been more inspired than I have by my parents, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure everybody is. So, so there are all these assumptions and they, they challenged the assumptions and they sought people who would support them. So there was a wonderful man, Father Eggleton, who was the um, local priest in the Anglican Church in Walkerville, who came in and said, actually, this is a false assumption about this family um, and about their capacity. It's a false assumption, it's a prejudice. You have to put that aside and look at the facts. Um, so they, f I guess they advocated on, ad advocated on a um, barrier by barrier basis, barrier by ba barrier basis. As you've got older, you, you, you inevitably reflect on your parents' life and their legacy. Mm. Uh, do you feel you're continuing what they started in some ways? Um, that would be an honour. Do you see it that way? As an honour? No, no, as, as a continuity. I don't feel like they told me you should do this. Mm. They told me um, you have a responsibility to use your gifts to the full. Mm. They told me um, that um, 
that people deserve to be treated with respect. They told me, they didn't tell me you should do this, ever. Mm. So do I feel like I'm continuing? I hope so. You were gifted with very good intelligence and after school in Adelaide, you could have gone to Melbourne University, but you chose to go to ANU, which had consequences in various ways, <laughs> uh, to do arch law initially. Yeah. Um, you were stirred by the, you thought you'd do family law, didn't you? I thought, I, so the Family Law Act had just come in, I think in 1975. Mm. And um, so I thought I would do law and psychology. And I remember meeting the Dean of the Law School and he said, so Ms. Rain, looking over his glasses at me, I see you're doing law, so you're doing legal method and constitutional law in second semester, and you're doing contracts. I said, that's right. And he said, um, and I see you're doing English, English literature, that makes a lot of sense. And he said, raising one eyebrow, I see you're doing psychology. <laughs> what has psychology got to do with the law? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, I was quite interested because the Family Law Act had come in and, um, and I thought that it would be really helpful to ha for a, a lawyer to have an understanding about children and development and relationships and what went wrong and I also was quite interested in how you might alternatively solve disputes because um, it seemed to me a lot of things ended up in court and that wasn't really good for anyone. When you and think said, back that's on that's the whole point of the law. <laughs> 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 so I did two years of law and then I stopped. Yes, I, I'm not sure about whether the whole point of the law is resolving disputes, we will leave that for another <laughs> conversation. Um, no, we, we, he said the whole point is to end up in court. Oh, I see. <laughs> That's more to the point, I thought. I can see now. Mm. Dibs. Mm. Uh, how old were you when you read Dibs? 13, 14. And Dibs, Dibs? Dibs in Search of Self. Yes. Tell us about Dibs in Search of Self, because that opened the door to psychology for you, didn't it? It made me interested in what processes people could use towards wholeness and healing. Mm. And um, I, I just found it fascinating. I found it fascinating, the story of a therapist. I mean, I haven't read it since then. It's a very long time ago. Um, I'll get you it. <laughs> um, but um, it was, it was um, about very gentle and careful work to help a child um, on a difficult journey. Dibs will not talk, he will not play. He has locked himself in a very special prison and he is alone. This is the true story of how he learned to reach out for the sunshine, for life, how he came to the breathless discovery of himself that brought him back to the world of other children. Mm. So um, there are lots of people who are locked like that, aren't there? Uh, so I've recently um, been visiting and um, work doing some support of a wonderful school in Brisbane which is called Milpera. Um, it's a school uh, which actually experienced the worst impacts of the flood, which is kind of ironic, um, had over two and a half metres of water through it in January this year. Um, it's a school which is specifically for um, refugee children and uh, children um, who um, are the children of newly arrived immigrants, most of whom don't speak much English, um, often who don't, uh, who don't read or write in their own language. And they are of high school age and they've arrived in this country. Many of them have experienced the most revolting things, mm. things that you never want mm. any, to happen to anyone or any child or young person to see. Um, so they've come out of war zones, their parents have been um, victims of torture and trauma, um, all sorts of things. And this is the most lovely school. And they actually use some dibs kind of things. So they're using um, some play therapy, they're using art therapy. Um, they start, they put the children in year groups uh, where um, for their age, not for their ability, um, and they start in exactly the way you want teaching to happen. They start where each child is, not where their age says they should be. And they just build out 
um, from there, but they're also often building very trusting relationships with continually present volunteers. There are over 100 volunteers who go there every week, some of whom have been going for 20 or 30 years. Goodness. Um, who are faithful and constant um, and who are supportive and encouraging and who are enabling. So that's kind of, in a way, so there are lots of people who are locked, who are locked away and who need a safe relationship and someone who believes in them and a focus on their strengths and building from where they are, not where they should be. Um, and who, when they have those preconditions, can move from where they are to where they dream and hope of being. This bears resemblance with Martin Seligman and some of his ideas around mm. hel uh, learned helplessness, which is what you wrote your honours thesis yeah. on. Yeah. So I was... Um, I so you're out of law. Yeah. And you're fully into psychology. Fully into psychology. And I spent a year of doing really applied psychology out at CCAE, then CCAE. Um, and I spent uh, six months of going to the psychiatric unit at what was then Woden Hospital. Um, and twice a week, um, for two full days a week. At the end of that, I was addicted to nicotine because any time in the psychodrama group things got tense, everybody else lit up. <laughs> so it took me two years to get, kind of, stop the cravings. Um, but the people, I, like, I, it's, it, the people who had um, schizophrenia, the people who are anxious, I, I, I found that um, quite possible. Um, to work with but I was really floored by people who were just really catatonically depressed and I needed I wanted to understand that so when I did my thesis I kind of did a, a whole lot of reading um, around depression and I came across Martin Seligman's work um, on learned helplessness as a model mm. of depression um, and particularly um, it was attribution of causality. So what's caused this? Something permanent about me, something random about the world, something I can't control or something I can control. And so that's what I did my thesis on. Um, I've continued to be interested in his work and I'm absolutely fascinated by his flip out of the clinical um, and out of the focus on um, what's wrong with people and into the focus on what makes people happy. Mm. What is happiness? How do you measure it? How do you define it? What are the factors that contribute to it? And applying, which is what he's done over the last 10 years, really leading a movement in positive psychology, yeah. um, researching um, what what contributes to all that and using all the methods of psychology, um, including assessments and research and all of those things to get to um, what helps people, what so helps people be happy. After that period of day in you, you go overseas for five years, you've married Ke Kevin, you've had two children, you've come back uh, and you need to decide what lies ahead. Yeah, so that's right. So I did, I did my thesis, I'd done my honours thesis and I thought, okay, so now we're going to go to Sweden. So I had a really big week. I packed, I did my, um, I did my honours thesis. I handed it in on the Tuesday, did my final exam on the Thursday, packed my apartment up on the Friday, got married on the Saturday mm -hmm. and left the country for five years for, with Kevin on the Sunday, right? So, <coughs> and there I was, I was, <laughs> so it was a big week. Nothing like being, you know, a working mother, but it was a big week for, at the time. And, um, and um, and what my plan was then when I left was I was going to do six months of Swedish and then I was going to do an 18 month masters in psychology at Uppsala University. Mm. So I did my six months of Swedish and I went and chatted to Uppsala University and then they changed, everybody changed the rules and you couldn't do postgrad at a Swedish university without 12 months of study in Swedish and they changed the masters degrees all to two years. And I knew I was leaving after two years total. So three into two don't go. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah. So I had babies instead. Because <laughs> I really when, when wanted you... to have babies. And so I came back to Australia after two years in Sweden, one year in, in Hong Kong, two years in China, um, with these two little E's. Let me pick you up on that uh, for a moment. When, when you say that nothing compares to uh, being a working mum, yeah, mm. you mean that? <laughs> well, that week, I, which I thought was a big week at the time, nothing like a week as a working mum. Mm. 
that's significant, isn't it? It's actually. Um, so I just remember. This, I remember one day with Marcus, who is gorgeous and 18 and about to finish school. So he's the youngest of the three. Yes, and he was two. And um, so I had to get Jesse to school and Nicholas to school, thankfully the same school, and I had to get Marcus up and dressed and fed and in the car and to childcare and be at work by nine o'clock for a board meeting. So he, he's a very strong person, Marcus, even at two, he was a very strong person. I have enormous Don't know where that came from. <laughs> respect for him. <laughs> and so at the, he didn't want to put those pants on and he didn't want to put those socks on, especially two of them, and he didn't want to put those shoes on <laughs> and he didn't want to eat his wheat bix just now and he didn't want to have his hair brushed. And then by the time we were ready to eat the wheat bix he didn't want to eat them because they were soggy. And then he didn't want to get in the car he didn't want to put his seatbelt on. He didn't want to get out of the car, and then he, and then he didn't want me to go. <sighs> and I what think the children, it? I don't know. <laughs> and I think the children had peanut butter sandwiches, you know, um, which is not very good. It's not very nutritious. And um, and so you know, there's this whole flogging thing that happens. And then um, anyway, and then uh, and then I arrived uh, to chair this board meeting at nine o'clock and I was there. <laughs> I was a little wrung out. And then I went at the end of the day to pick him up from childcare and he didn't want to leave childcare. <laughs> he didn't, didn't want to start this whole cycle again. <laughs> he just, he, no, he just had me really <laughs> the entire time. And I eventually got to pick the children up from after school care and get home and make dinner. And I got to the end of Friday and Kevin walked in the door and he'd been traveling with Wayne Goss, who was then mm. Premier. Um, and um, <clears throat> I thought, this is massive. <laughs> I just I can't keep doing this. I don't know how to keep doing this. And he was working, you know, I don't know, 80, 90 hour weeks. So um, it's, it's hard. I think that's really hard. It's very difficult for, um, it's very difficult for young parents. And at that point in time, there was not a whole lot of expectation from workplaces that blokes would contribute as much, um, or that it, there wasn't a whole lot of give if he wanted to go to the school concert instead of me. Just there's one so, there's one building block in this story I just want to add, and that is. When you came back from overseas, you took on a role for a time as a school counsellor yeah. and, and then started in, in work re rehabilitation. Mm. So those, those things were, again, practical steps towards what was to happen with the yeah. establishment in 89 of work directions. Yeah, so I, I worked, um, I, I finished my, master, my ma master's coursework in school counselling and then I looked around for a job and I wanted something just 10 hours a week. Um, for sanity, um, that was pre Marcus, and um, and um, so and I found a job as a rehabilitation counsellor, and I knew I was in the right place. I just you know, about you know I met about the third client, and I knew that I was in the right place because I understood about injury and how it affects people, that it affects their families as well, that it affects their self-esteem, that it affects, it can affect their, their earning capacity, it can affect their capacity to do an occupation at all um, and certainly the occupational identity that they had before. Um, and it can create secondary um, anxiety and depression and it is a whole family's journey to recovery, not just the person's. And I knew that you that problem solving um, was um, not done to people but with them. Um, that if if problem answers are given to people, they don't own them and they can't see how to do it. So you have to work alongside people to create that, and you have to do that respectfully, working off their strengths. And so, being a rehabilitation counsellor, which is my, I guess, my more fundamental identity as a professional, um, was exactly the right thing for me to be doing. There are a couple of things going on. Well, firstly, in '89, you set up Work Directions, which was become Ingius in 2002. Uh, that's only 21 years ago, mm. and you now operate in what eight countries? Mm, Ten. Ten countries. Mm. 
1,500 people work for the organisation? Um, it's a bit more now. How many? <laughs> um, about 2,500 probably uh, full time and then um, through, we're the largest welfare to work provider in Britain which is amazing for a little Brisbane company isn't it um, and um, so we directly employ um, about 1500 people there and um, and then indirectly through subcontractors about another 2000. So, well, this is just an amazing success by any measure um, and that you've actually steered that is a remarkable story too but um, what, what was the key to the success? Was it that actually government was going through a phase of outsourcing to the private sector a lot of services that it used to do itself, particularly in workplace transition or transitions to work? Um, I think that um, I think that the attitude I always take is um, to chat to people about what's working for them. Um, that is, chat to policymakers about what's working for you, what's not working for you. Who are you worried about? Um, what could work better? How could work that work better? Um, how would you know it is working better? How would you measure the difference? Um, and then um, can we work with you to make that happen? I've had those conversations in um, Britain, uh, in France, in Germany, in Sweden, in Switzerland, um, in South Korea. Um, in Australia a long time ago, not recently at all. Um, and um, um, in New Zealand, in Canada, so in Japan, in all these different countries, in Saudi Arabia, we've had these conversations. Um, and the thing is that we are very, um, we actually want to make a difference. I, this is fascinating. I, you're saying then that actually these opportunities came along through, in a sense, a intelligence gathering dance that you did with various governments looking at unmet needs. So um, there was a line in a French newspaper that where the head of the unemployment insurer in France, um, the head of UNIDIC, um, said, uh, we have 18 billion or something um, euros of unfunded liability in our unemployment insurance system. And there was another couple of lines which said, maybe we should think about doing things differently. So I asked for an appointment to see him and he went, Sorry, is this the government official or the minister? The head, no, it's the head of the, um, it's the, the bureaucrat, if you like, the civil servant who was responsible for trying to find a way out of this. Mm -hmm. um, so, and he went, well, this person from Australia has asked to come and see me to see if she can help. That's odd. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, but he decided to have a chat and um, we, so, and he was a statistician, so he loved numbers, I love numbers. Dad taught me to love numbers. Um, and so we talked about what was the, what was the um, average time that someone over the age of, um, or between the age of 18 and 25 was on benefits, um, this particular system of benefits. Um, and um, what was the average time and what percentage of them were um, not on benefits for the long term. Um, what was the average time for 25 to 50 year olds and the average time for 50 plus year olds? Um, and then um, what did a day on benefits mean? And I said, well, every day counts, doesn't it? Every day counts for the person, um, every day counts for their family, every day counts for the community, every day counts from the point of view of how much employers have to contribute to this and how much workers have to contribute to this every day counts for how much you are paying out. So it was an average of 31 euros a day was being paid out. So we worked out. Um, uh, if we intervened and we helped X number of people off those benefits um, and into decent lasting jobs uh, within a certain period of time, um, what, um, with this fee, um, how much would they save? How much money would he save? And 
Um, so we talked about when the point of intervention should be and I talked about early intervention and why, appropriate identification and which groups should be eligible and why um, and we agreed on that based on the points of inflection in the graph and we agreed on, um, on an experiment, two cities of significant enough size that it was significant, statistically significant, it would mean something and he could draw policy implications from that um, and then we um, and then we ran the experiment and I said you can't actually start to evaluate this until my nine months in. He said I want to evaluate at six months and, it's, and, he, and he came to see our sites in Britain and he said, Therese, if you can give me this, ça c'est mon rêve, this is my dream. If you can give me this, you will make me a happy man. <laughs> so and Then we delivered it for him and he said, Therese, you have made me a happy man. <laughs> because um, actually he saved 18 million euros. So and he took it across the whole country. What's the model here? Is it, is it a, a partnership towards, in the first instance, creating a pilot scheme? So really important to do a proof of concept um, and to do it on a, on a measurable, containable basis with risk sharing between us and the purchaser um, where it's very clear what the key performance indicators are and what would look different if this was successful and not having a million of those but having a few of those and having it administratively simple. Um, and then it's really important to have a third party evaluation of that, not us evaluating or the purchaser evaluating because we might kind of want things to work um, and, um, and then it has to be scalable. And so I encouraged him to, to not just take it national by using us. I encouraged him to have competition and measurability. How did you learn all this? Because what you're doing is talking about a quite sophisticated model of uh, creating a project. But that's a long way from where you began. Um, I, um, I suppose I'm quite pragmatic. I'm interested in helping people in a meaningful way. I believe, I personally believe that government matters. I also believe that policy matters um, and that policy can help provide the framework with, a, with sensible procu procurement practice, um, that it can help provide the framework for helping people change their lives. Um, I guess I had seen it in lots of ways through various kinds of rehabilitation systems around the country. Um, so we um, were at one stage the largest independent re uh, vocational rehabilitation provider in Australia. We were accredited to Comcare and every state and territory system. And we saw um, the importance of having clarity of roles um, and clear roles and responsibilities, rights and responsibilities for all stakeholders. And we saw the, the um, essential nature of win-win, win-win um, solutions. So it has to be, it has to be sustainable, and for s things to be sustainable, they have to be sustainable for the person who's the client. Have to be sustainable for the purchaser. They have to be sustainable for the policy maker and for the government behind that. They have to be financially sustainable, and they have to be financially sustainable, and basically good work for the provider and for their staff and for their suppliers. If all of that's not met, if that virtuous, cir virtuous circle is not met, then things fall apart. Can a not-for-profit business do this just as easily as a for-profit business? Um, can a not-for-profit do which? What you've described. Um, I don't know that a not-for-profit organisation from Australia, given the taxation laws about um, about purpose and um, deductible gift recipients, can take risk with the money in order to do that going overseas. Although I think maybe a number of them are. I think um, the procurement. I think what we saw, what we've seen with the job network, um, and um, and its various iterations before and after it was called that, is that for-profit providers and not-for-profit providers' um, behaviour um, is shaped by the procurement practice, by the purchasing practice, and by the contract management practice. And I think that 
um, that um, everybody becomes very governed by what is the purpose of this, what's the definition of an outcome, um, and, and behaviour is driven by the nature of the contract. Just more broadly, the, if you call the influence, the major influence on your philosophy as sort of positive psychology, um, is that transferable to many other people of disadvantage? Mm. Uh, indigenous people, for example, or people with disabilities? Well, so what's, I think, quite interesting is we started as an Australian company and um, after speaking at a conference in Britain, I was asked to consider seeking accreditation there and delivering there. Um, and so there's a first kind of jump, which is can what we do in Australia, which is treat everybody with respect, treat everybody as an individual, um, start by assessing people's strengths and their fields of fascination and their competencies um, and what gives them joy and what uh, where time just vanishes for them Ca and taking um, a one-to-one -one case management approach, approach so they've got someone with them all the way um, and um, where they're taking one little step at a time that was, that was our approach. Can you take that and apply that in Britain? So we experimented and it worked. So we doubled the performance of the previous provider in the first six months from a standing start. Um, so that was interesting. So okay, it works in the um, UK and particularly English context. Well, what about if you take it to France? completely the opposite side of the Enlightenment in terms of <laughs> philosophical framework, completely different discourse, mm -hmm. um, very different labour laws, completely different, completely different benefits regime, completely different sense of solidarity and rights and responsibilities. Um, so let's try. Well, it worked. Outstanding results compared with what was happening. Um, okay, so does it transfer to Germany? It does. People want to be treated with respect. People recover in the context, recover confidence in the context of positive relationships, um, focusing on their strengths. Um, people recover if they can take one small step and experience success. People recover better and sooner and faster and more um, at less cost if there is early intervention. People respond to basic human rights, basic dignity, and a belief in them. Um, same in Sweden, same in Switzerland, same in Poland, same in South Korea. So we've jumped to a Confucian framework, a Confucian philosophical framework, same in Saudi Arabia, where we now have five offices, four of which are delivering to uh, blokes, and one in Jeddah, which is working with women, all of whom are wearing the veil. Um, and um, we've only been open there um, just over a month and over a hundred women in Saudi Arabia and Jeddah have made the transition into employment. So there is something fundamentally human about this process that is not, I think, constrained by um, the benefits regime or the, um, the sense of um, rights and responsibilities or um, the philosophical environment or the labour market laws, um, people respond to people who believe in them. Therese, thank you very much. My pleasure, thank you.